Welcome, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and welcome to this event, co-hosted by the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs, which is a new nonprofit research-focused organization based in Washington, DC, and IWPR um, based in Central Asia. It's the first of a, what we hope to be a series of events that we organize together. And today's event is on a very topical theme of vaccine diplomacy regionalism and geopolitical influence in Central Asia. Globally, I think a year into the pandemic, we're hopefully turning a corner as the vaccines, various vaccines around the world are being rolled out and distributed. This is also true in Central Asia, where last month we saw vaccines being rolled out in different countries in the region. But today we're gonna to dig into some of the political implications of the choice of different vaccines by different countries in the region, what this says about the influence of external players in Central Asia, what this says about regionalism in Central Asia. And so we've assembled an all-star um, panel to focus and, and explore this issue with us today. But before we turn it over to the panel and we hear from them, I'm gonna turn over to uh, my friend Abokhan Sultan Lazarov, who is the regional director at IWPR. Central Asia. Uh, thank you very much, Edward. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you tonight at the IWPR Central Asia and the OXU Society online discussion. Uh, first of all, let me express my gratitude to our trusted old and who we know for many years. Uh, we have been cooperating with him and now with the OXU Society. And time and time again, you know, we find our cooperation fruitful and beneficial for us, for the expert community, and for all Central Asia. So thus, we are very honored and proud to be holding this event tonight. Uh, conducting a discussion about the challenges faced uh, by our Central Asian region allows us to bring together international experts and experienced analysts and to hear their opinions on the existing problem and hear possible solutions. Such a practice uh, allows uh, for cross fertilization and generation of unique new ideas. So today we'll talk about the most timely and acute question, vaccination and, ge and geopolitics around it. Uh, while concurring the virus is the most important goal for every country nowadays, big powers and powerful actors tend to compete and increase their influence. So, this requires countries of Central Asia to navigate through the new power play and a thorough analysis is needed. Hence, we are here today to listen, to discuss and ask questions from our distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, I hope today our invited experts can guide us through this important topic and provide a detailed accounts of the politics around the COVID-19 vaccination. I really look forward uh, to a fruitful discussion and thank you very much for your attention. Edward, back to you, please. Thank you, Abakon. Uh, we share your excitement about the event and I hope it's going to be a fruitful and interesting discussion for everyone who's attending. If you have a question whilst we're hearing from the speakers, if something comes into your mind at the time they're speaking, please type it into the chat. Um, afterwards, we will have some time for q and I'm going to ask that the speakers try and keep their remarks to under eight minutes so that we have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. But first, we're going to hear from Professor Alexander Cooley, who is the Claire Tao Professor of Political Science at Barnard College in New York and the director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. His most important affiliation, of course, is that he's on the advisory council of the, the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs. So we're delighted to have Alex with us today, and he's going to take us through um, the vaccine diplomacy and the international relations of vaccines at a global level. Thanks so much, Ed. Thank you. Uh, Abagan, thank you, IWPR and OXA. It's a pleasure to be with you. I have a few slides, so I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. Hopefully, we've all become semi-competent at this. I will never describe myself as competent. Um, okay, so uh, Ed has asked me to talk a little bit in general about the international politics, international relations. I won't mention Central Asia too much, but hopefully 
we will see some themes emerge that are very relevant to Central Asia and a few examples that are relevant to Central Asia. We see a lot about this idea that COVID-19, especially vaccine diplomacy, is becoming a geopolitical tool, a geopolitical weapon in the battle for global influence, particularly amongst emerging countries, Russia and China, India, as mentioned sometimes, um, and the sort of, you know, diminishing uh, influence of the West and uh, the liberal international order. This is a typical headline, and this is a piece uh, in Bloomberg uh, that tells us Russia and China are beating the West at vaccine diplomacy, right? While the West hoards its COVID jabs like rocket fuel, Russia and China are deploying them strategically around the world, we, we, you know, which gives us the sense that, um, you know, vaccine diplomacy, COVID jabs are an instrument of influence. And, and I want to uh, uh, interrogate that a little bit and complicate that uh, in today's uh, presentation. Not because I don't think it's important, but because I think there are some nuances. I want to talk actually about three mechanisms through which I think vaccine development and diplomacy can possibly impact international relations. Uh, the first is this tension between vaccine nationalism and inequality, and whether the system of global governance and cooperation that we have can solve it, right? can solve it effectively. Second, perceptions of competence in dealing with COVID and, and vaccine, uh, 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 vaccine administration. And third, uh, the, 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 the specific issue of collective or public goods and using vaccines in those ways as influences. So um, the first is simply, uh, we have a situation where vaccine nationalism uh, that is rich countries hoarding vaccines taken for themselves are going to leave poor countries behind, right? And this was a controversial map that was put out by The Economist last month that shows that according to their estimates, many countries in the developing world are not going to receive the vaccines until late 2022 or 2023. We're not going to have full vaccinations uh, until then. This was disputed. Actually, some of the Sputnik people uh, disputed this, but this is sort of, you know, one of the initial uh, kind of uh, prognications. Uh, what's the problem? The problem is that rich countries, Canada, United States, UK, European Union, it's not very clear here on the left, pre-ordered a bunch of vaccine, multiple times their population size, right? In Canada, it's 500 times population size. Uh, uh, in the US, it was 200. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the EU, it was 300, though they've had, uh, uh, I mean, also 200, and they had problems rolling out. In the UK, it was 300. And then other countries, uh, and if you go all the way down, you'll see upper middle income and lower lower middle income did not take those same steps, right? They did not uh, uh, pre-order or reach these contractual deals. So we have a problem. As a result, uh, the international community has put together this COVAX program, which is led by WHO, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Uh, and the idea here is to pool procurement and deliver 2 billion doses of vaccines to poorer countries by the end of 2021. 183 countries have joined this, including China, Japan, the EU. The US and Russia initially ruled out joining. Uh, the US has since joined from the Biden administration. Russia has indicated it'll participate in a small way uh, since. So this is the main mechanism, this COVAX uh, mechanism. The problem is that deliveries have been very slow from COVAX. And as well, there's an interesting case from Kyrgyzstan that perhaps you can talk more about internally where a uh, health minister uh, last month said that the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine that was going to come to Kyrgyzstan does not fit Kyrgyzstan. Why? Because it has to be stored at a very low temperature, sub 70 degrees Celsius. And although there were 1.2 million doses offered, uh, the refrigerator costs would be prohibitively high and uh, Kyrgyzstan doesn't have the freezer. So they would need $2 million more for the vaccine. They don't have funds in the budget. This then leads to talks over uh, acquiring Sputnik. Uh, you know, the point about this story, though, it, is it encapsulates this idea of sort of inequality um, in the vaccine system, but also the global governance system being, you know, uh, incompetent, right? Uh, you know, not, not listening to the needs of countries like Kyrgyzstan, taking steps unilaterally, uh, uh, and not uh, having their uh, ear on the ground to have a good local solution. My second mechanism, so that's, that's the global governance of, 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 of inequality and vaccine nationalism. The second me mechanism is competence. Uh, look, how countries manage the epidemic is a form of soft power. It is a form of authority that they have. Initially, over the summer, we saw very bad marks for the United States 
quite good marks for the EU, um, but also actually bad marks for China. And this is just some data from the Pew survey taken over the summer, sort of, you know, uh, uh, that found that both uh, China and the US have been perceived as doing a very bad job at handling the pandemic. And these are polls of 14 countries uh, in the developed world. US was really bad, 84%, but China was really bad too, right? At sort of 61%. So if this was the moment in which China was gonna rise and overtake the US because of its competence, it hasn't happened, right? Um, but I also think that we have now moved to a new metric. And the new metric is who can deliver vaccine doses effectively. Um, despite all the deaths that we have had in the US, half a million, um, uh, I think this is the metric that now we're seeing uh, more and more invoked in public diplomacy as to how effective a particular country is. And on this metric, how many vaccine doses administered per 100 people, who's ahead? Israel. <laughs> Israel's vaccinated everyone, right? UAE. UK is doing very well in vaccine rollout, even though they were perceived as quite incompetent when Johnson sort of initially went the herd immunity route uh, last spring. And the U.S. is doing pretty well, too. It's administering 2 million doses. Who's not doing well? European Union is not doing well, right? Uh, uh, based on the data, uh, China and Russia internally, too, although uh, there are more problems there. So my point is, perceptions of how countries deal are very fluid. And I think we are going to remember the last metric uh, as opposed to the summer metric. So these perceptions of competence, I think, also matter. Um, but let me talk about what we, what we really are going to be focusing on, this idea that vaccines are collective goods, right? And that emerging powers who provide vaccines as collective goods uh, can then wield influence. Uh, President Xi Jinping uh, uh, says this quite openly. He says, China's virus vaccine will be a global public good. It's not a global public good because you have to pay for it, right? So it's not in the standard definition, but it is a collective good. And it is an attempt to translate, just like with development assistance or investment, um, the provision of goods in exchange for influence. Yeah. So uh, how might we think about this? Well, again, you see kind of this is just from Axios a couple of days ago. Latin America turns to China and Russia for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, will this amount to geopolitical influence? Uh, I would say there's very little evidence for this. So when China, this time last year, started rolling out medical goods diplomacy to countries like Italy and Spain, um, all around the world, 150 countries, um, you saw as many negative stories as positive stories about the Chinese efforts, right? Uh, the negative focused on China's wily intentions, on the shoddy quality of the goods involved, on how it was trying to uh, push its Belt and Road Initiative and pry EU countries from the EU. So I would say, um, with a couple of exceptions, uh, it wasn't particularly effective. But what vaccine diplomacy does do, it plays into existing regional and global agendas. It offers another tool. So in China, vaccine diplomacy is another good offered in these BRI Health Silk Route Cooperation bundles. It's usually bundled with other goods, uh, private and club goods. And for Russia, um, the development of Sputnik uh, uh, you can see them targeting areas that the West has not reached, uh, countries that are ambivalent as being part of the liberal international order. It's not cheaper, <laughs> even though they pretend that it is, um, and it enhances Russian prestige. It's often used as a diplomatic lever, and it is also now being bundled in the, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union um, agenda, right? So, so there is a place for vaccine diplomacy, but it is operating within these agendas. So let me give you an example from the Philippines. Uh, their vaccine diplomacy has been integrated as a goods package for the Philippines, uh, promise of a half million doses in addition to 1.3 billion loan pledges for infrastructure um, and grants um, to that country. My final point though is all this uh, might be true, we might have effective geopolitics, but there are three areas I would argue of domestic politics that will also affect how this plays out on the ground. First, is the preference for multi-vectorism and hedging suppliers. We all know Central Asian countries uh, practice multi-vector diplomacy, but honestly, when it comes to vaccines, every competent government should practice multi-vector diplomacy. Why? You don't wanna be reliant on any one supplier. You don't want any one supplier to have complete political leverage over you. Um, so multi-vectorism when it comes to vaccines um, should be axiomatic. And you've seen this. And so these slides that Latin America is procuring from China is procuring from Russia. Well, they're procuring from everywhere. 
most of these countries, right? Uh, you know, maybe the Turkmen example in Central Asia is different with an exclusive deal for Sputnik, um, but you should be going in multiple places. Two, what I see is that certain political elites and parties usually dispose to what I call multipolar politics, right? Signaling their intent to cooperate with Russia or China are using vaccine diplomacy in that service. Viktor Orban, prime minister of Hungary in that picture is getting a Chinese vaccine and he's making a public showing of it. Um, but he's always touted the importance of Chinese cooperation as a way of taking a dig at the EU. This isn't changing his agenda, right? So I'm also sort of skeptical this is changing minds. I'm not sure, maybe, but let's, let's see more data. And then my final point is, you may have heard this term, we're not only in a pandemic, we're an infodemic. The amount of misinformation surrounding vaccines, whether it's personal harm, origin, all of this is also going to flood the zone and I think is going to mediate and filter any kind of geopolitical influence. Is there even a guarantee that people are going to know what jab that they're taking, right? Or that they're going to know <laughs> accurately um, who has procured for what? So I do think domestic politics is a big part of the story too. So all this to say is, um, I, you know, vaccine diplomacy is real. It's another tool. It's very high profile. Um, and in some cases, the contracts are big. So I don't mean to minimize the stakes, but is it a game changer on its own? I'm a little more skeptical, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what my colleagues have to say about Central Asia in particular. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Cooley, for that fantastic overview. Lots of food for thought that hopefully we can unpack in the uh, upcoming presentations and maybe further in the Q&A. So next, we're going to turn to uh, Dr. Parviz Mullajanov, who is a visiting researcher at the uh, School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences, um, HESS in Paris. Um, and he is going to uh, give his thoughts on the impact that COVID-19, the, the vaccine diplomacy, the vaccine rollout is having on regionalism, regional relations in Central Asia. Are these, do we still, maybe he's dropped off the call. Um, if Parviz has disappeared, then maybe we can turn next, and hopefully he can rejoin us. We can turn next instead to Judy Twigg, um, who is a professor of political science at Virginia Commonwealth University, um, where she teaches uh, courses on global health and uh, with a particular focus on um, Eurasia. So uh, she's going to take us through um, the uh, Sputnik vaccine and some of Russia's vaccine diplomacy in Central Asia. So Judy, if you don't mind uh, speaking, then we will turn to you. Thanks very much, Ed, for that introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to share some thoughts with such an excellent distinguished audience. Obviously, there's no more urgent and timely subject than the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, the arena right now where we're hearing about things is in vaccines and vaccine diplomacy. So I'll share some thoughts about Russia, which I follow most closely. Uh, in terms of vaccine diplomacy, Russia was clearly the first country in the world um, out of the gate. We all know that Sputnik V, uh, V for victory, uh, was the first COVID vaccine in the world to be approved by a national government back in August of 2020. And that approval came with great fanfare. Uh, the fact that the vaccine's website was launched in seven languages, I think tells us everything we need to know about the intended audience for Sputnik V. It wasn't just domestic, it was a global audience that they were aiming for. Sputnik V is now registered in more than 40 countries. They added Sri Lanka to the list this morning and, and it's hard to keep up because the number of countries that have approved Sputnik V increases every day. There has been special interest in the Latin American countries in Sputnik V and particular headway with European Union members in Eastern Europe. Uh, Hungary began administering Sputnik V about two weeks ago. Uh, the Czech Republic intends to move forward. Slovakia has approved it. There are conversations with Austria. And this is all without Sputnik V having yet been approved by the European regulator, the European Medicines Agency. So this is extraordinary. Um, although this morning we have word that the European Medicines Agency announced that it's beginning a formal review of Sputnik V. It's likely to be officially approved by the EU soon. 
So the developer of Sputnik V, the Gamaleya Institute in, in Moscow should be congratulated for its scientific achievement. Uh, the vaccine was confirmed last month as safe and highly effective in a peer review publication in The Lancet, one of the world's leading medical journals. Uh, Sputnik V has been rolled out widely across Russia. It's very easy to get vaccinated in Moscow, wide availability in clinics across the country. In fact, if you go to Goom, the luxury department store right off of Red Square, you can get free ice cream along with your jab. Um, so in, in Moscow um, and in other parts of Russia, it appears actually that supply of Sputnik V outstrips demand. And we can talk about that later if you'd like. It looks like there is substantial vaccine hesitancy in Russia. Uh, there are many COVID deniers in Russia, many people who are anti-vaccine in general, and certainly many people who don't trust specifically the Sputnik V vaccine in Russia. Um, but that's that's the domestic situation in Russia. Let's talk internationally. Um, internationally, in terms of exercising soft power through the provision, or at least the offer of provision of vaccines, uh, Russia got off to a head start. Uh, Russia was aggressively marketing Sputnik V well before any of the Western vaccines had cleared regulatory approval. Many countries now have deals to get Sputnik V doses straight from Russia. There are many more deals that have been set up to receive Sputnik V doses that have been manufactured somewhere else, especially in India. Uh, and there are many other countries that are cutting deals to receive the formula and technology for Sputnik V from Russia so that they can make the vaccine themselves. So what are Russia's goals here? I think Russia has three goals with Sputnik V. First of all, Sputnik V is obviously a symbol of Russia's return to great power status. It's about pride, it's about national stature, it's about respect. Uh, being the first in the world to blaze the trail for the way out of a once in a century global pandemic puts Russia back on the map in their view as a great scientific and technological power. And they portray Sputnik V this way quite deliberately. If you think back to when Sputnik V was first approved in August, um, for the first couple of weeks that the Sputnik V website was set up, it had a feature where it took a couple of seconds for the site to load. There was a built-in delay. And during that delay, you were encouraged to push a button on the screen and turn your sound all the way up. And when you push that button, what you got was the audio of the beeps that we heard broadcast from space back in 1957, when the first Soviet Sputnik satellite, the first man-made object in space, uh, when that satellite was launched. So that was a hallmark moment for Soviet superiority in the space race. It is no accident that they're evoking that moment now, um, even using the name Sputnik for the vaccine. Secondly, clearly Russia wants to exercise soft power with this vaccine. Uh, poor and middle income countries, as Alex pointed out, are desperate for access to vaccines. Russia realizes or hopes that there is diplomatic benefit from appearing as a savior during this unprecedented global crisis. And in particular, again, as Alex pointed out, Russia is contrasting its own generosity against the perceived selfishness of the United States, Canada, European countries that have gobbled up all of the available doses of Pfizer, Moderna, uh, some of the other European vaccines um, through these pre-purchase agreements. Um, the rich countries have pre-purchased enough vaccine to cover their own populations several times over, leaving the rest of the world with nothing. This has happened before. Uh, think back to the early years with antiretroviral medications for HIV AIDS, Rich countries got them all years before millions of dying people got them in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Russia is very anxious to highlight these historical and current inequities. Last but certainly not least for Russia, this is a business opportunity. Uh, COVID vaccines are a multi-billion dollar business and Russia clearly wants to maximize market share here. They're offering Sputnik V at about $20 for the full course of two doses. As Alex said, that's not necessarily cheaper than some of the other alternatives that are emerging, but it is quite a bit cheaper than Pfizer or Moderna, the, the more innovative uh, mRNA vaccines. So I think there's a longer term set of business interests here. Russia has not traditionally been much of a player on global pharmaceutical markets, and clearly they'd like this vaccine to be a wedge to get other countries to consider buying other drugs from Russia as well. So there's a lot Russia would like to achieve. 
with Sputnik V. But there are some important caveats here when thinking about how likely it is that Russia is achieving these goals or is likely to achieve these goals. First is that the way Russia has proceeded hasn't exactly inspired confidence. Um, both international consumers and Russian consumers have legitimate lingering doubts about Sputnik V because of the way Sputnik V was approved before it had even entered large scale phase three clinical trials. Russia put the cart way before the horse. Uh, there's a perception, and it's a correct perception, that development was rushed, that Sputnik V kind of skipped the line, um, so to speak. It didn't go through a full scientific and regulatory vetting because there was so much top-down political pressure for Russia to be first in the vaccine race. And there was a fear that this may have impacted the vaccine's safety and quality. Now, this is a gamble they took, a huge gamble they took, that paid off. You know, that we now know that the, the vaccine is safe and effective, but it was a tremendous risk. Uh, there was reputational risk. If they had launched the vaccine with all this fanfare and then it hadn't worked, or if there had been incidents of people who were harmed by the vaccine because it wasn't safe, um, thank goodness that didn't happen, but, but there was tremendous reputational risk involved. There was also public health risk. What if people had taken Sputnik V, thought they were protected, and then spread the virus because they stopped wearing masks or stopped practicing social distancing? Or what if Sputnik V hadn't worked and that had had an overall negative impact on people's trust in vaccines, uh, depressed people's willingness to get vaccinated, even with the good vaccines that are out there? So there's still a lot about this accelerated development and approval timetable that has left a bad taste in, uh, in a lot of people's mouths. It's, it's depressed trust in the vaccine. Uh, second, because Russia's efforts, to, uh, Russia's efforts were able to achieve such a visibility with Sputnik V largely because the traditional global health powers, uh, the United States, Western Europe, uh, they had essentially withdrawn from the global health space. Um, this is especially an issue with the United States and the Trump administration. Obviously, there was a vacuum left by the American abandonment of global health institutions and responsibility. This predates the um, COVID-19 pandemic. This goes back to the early days of the Trump administration's America First policies. And so from an international perspective, President Trump's selfish policies, leaving World Health Organization, refusing to join or contribute to COVAX, uh, this left a clear opening for Russia to realize those initial soft power gains with Sputnik V. And so the key question now is whether or not that vacuum that was created by the absence of the United States, whether that vacuum is receding, whether or not Russia's golden moment, when it was the only game in town, when its vaccine generosity was generating all the headlines, um, is that golden moment being supplanted? Is it being nudged aside by COVAX, um, the, the global vaccine facility that Alex described, and by other bilateral deals that are now emerging for poor and middle income countries? So a couple of points here. One is that there was a moment not too long ago when it appeared that COVAX might never get off the ground. You know, the Trump administration wasn't contributing. Uh, globally, contributions to it were, were anemic. But it's clear now that, uh, that COVAX is, has been launched and its deliveries are accelerating literally with each passing day. The Biden administration has pledged $2 billion to COVAX right off the bat. Uh, Two billion more are on the table if matching funds materialize from other donors. It's very clear that COVAX is going to be the centerpiece for low and middle income country access to vaccines throughout the rest of, the rest of 2021 and into 2022. And I'll note that Russia has chosen not to participate in COVAX in any major way. It's not a donor of funds, and it's chosen not to have Sputnik V as part of the COVAX portfolio of vaccines. Russia has said specifically that it prefers to translate or to transmit Sputnik V through the kinds of bilateral deals that it's been making. Um, Second point I'll make here is to echo uh, something that Alex said earlier, um, that most countries that have taken delivery of Sputnik V um, have diversified their vaccine portfolios. And of course they should have done this and should be doing this. They are not exclusively reliant on Russia. So one key question here is how long are everyone's memories? Um, how long do people remember the Trump administration's selfishness? Um, how long do they remember Russia's initial 
exclusivity in the realm of vaccine diplomacy? How much do they remember the scientific gamble that Russia took uh, with the premature approval of Sputnik V? And how quickly can the Biden administration return to this space? Uh, how, uh, how much does the newfound goodwill for Russia exist in places that will be particularly useful in the longer term? And that brings us to Central Asia. Um, others know more specifically about Central Asia than I do, so I'll just make a few quick points. Uh, one is that Russia has a clear interest in getting the Central Asian countries vaccinated because it needs migrant labor from Central Asia to return to Russia. Um, as the Russian economy picks back up, there's a growing labor shortage in Russia in drivers, construction, delivery services, and so that labor mobility is something that Russia is very interested in, in seeing return. There are also political moves, um, motives. Uh, Russia is clearly making a play to counter Chinese influence in the region. This is Russia's own backyard traditionally. Central Asia has been one of the few places where Russia has sold other kinds of vaccines uh, over recent decades, other pharmaceutical pro products. Um, as we said before, all five Central Asian countries have registered Sputnik V or are talking with Russia, but none are counting exclusively on Russia. And I'll point here, especially to Kazakhstan, uh, which started mass vaccination back on February 1st using Sputnik V. Um, but uh, Kazakhstan was also the first country in the world a couple of weeks ago to announce that it will start local production of Sputnik V. And I'll note importantly that this is also in addition to Kazakhstan's own COVID vaccine. So very important in terms of the, uh, the Central Asian vaccine landscape. Um, I'll also note that there are other donors active in Central Asia, especially no one's mentioned uh, yet the multilateral development banks. The Asian Development Bank just announced a $9 billion COVID vaccine initiative. Extraordinary because ADB usually doesn't have a, a health as a very big part of its portfolio. And the World Bank just announced a $12 billion vaccine effort. Um, and Tajikistan is one of the first four countries to get financing there. Um, some of this money from the multilateral development banks is going through COVAX. Some is going to support countries to buy vaccines through bilateral arrangements. And importantly, much of it is going to support logistics and capacity building for vaccine administration. So Alex mentioned before that uh, Kyrgyzstan had to turn away from the uh, Pfizer vaccine because of the cold storage requirements. It's that kind of hurdle, logistical hurdle, that the multilateral development bank uh, money and increasingly USAID money um, and some other bilateral donor money is intended to um, to help overcome. Um, it's a pretty good bet that none of this multilateral development bank money is going toward Russia or going towards Sputnik V. So. The big picture here, just to, to conclude, the most important perspective, taking a step back, is that we just need as many good vaccines as we can get deployed as quickly as we can deploy them, no matter where they come from. And in that sense, it's somewhat unfortunate that the tenor of the conversation is, uh, is so much about competition rather than about collaboration. And Russia makes this statement all the time. You know, Russia makes the point about we just want good vaccine and can't we all rise above politics? But this is a little disingenuous since Russia is making this statement in the exact same breath as it's touting the superiority of its own product and engaging in a little bit of disinformation about the Western alternatives. Um, Central Asia clearly is emerging as one of the most important arenas for this diplomatic competition. And I thank you for the opportunity to contribute some thoughts and look forward to uh, learning more from the other speakers. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Twig, for that overview of, of Russia's multifaceted um, efforts in this regard. Um, I think next we'll logically turn to Timur Umarov, who is a consultant at the Carnegie um, Moscow Center um, and an expert on China's Central Asia relations, who's going to take us through China's vaccine diplomacy. And then hopefully we'll turn to Parviz at the end to talk about um, some of the, the regional implications. So, Timur, over to you. Yes, thank you very much for um, having me. Um, I, I would start uh, by uh, saying that um, although uh, Russia was the first to um, announced that um, it uh, registered the vaccine. Uh, China was the first to start working on the vaccines and it was first to, um, you know, uh, register a COVID case and 
uh, it had uh, much more time to do that. Um, and already in September 2020, um, all across the country, medical workers, um, border um, inspectors, members of the military, uh, other uh, governmental uh, employees, and even uh, Huawei employees have um, access to domestically developed uh, vaccines that were still going um, under the uh, clinical trials. Um, so um, for, for um, a long time, China has been um, not uh, uh, publicly uh, having those trials. And today, um, actually uh, last week, uh, two more domestic developed uh, vaccines applied for uh, public rollouts, um, and uh, one of them is a single dose shot uh, vaccine. Uh, so, um, and, and and plus to that, there are all, all also also other five vaccines that are undergoing clinical trials in China. Um, uh, taking into consideration all of that that effort um, and resources that uh, China has. Uh, it seems uh, very unusual that uh, the numbers of uh, domestic rollout um, of the vaccines um, in China are very slow. Um, of course, there are a bunch of different reasons from uh, China has the biggest population in the world. Uh, the, um, there is a high uh, vaccine hesitancy um, in, in, in the uh, society. Uh, but it seems that um, uh, at the moment, Beijing hasn't um, this, uh, ha doesn't have to rush its uh, vaccination campaign because we see that the virus um, is uh, more or less under control. Um, there is no uh, sense of urgency among the population to get vaccinated. So um, uh, China uses um, all of its vaccine producing capacity to uh, roll out its um, uh, vaccine diplomacy campaign. Um, and here, uh, Chinese vaccines have um, several advantages uh, uh, in contrast to uh, the, the Western uh, vaccines, to Pfizer and Moderna, for example. Uh, they don't have to be, uh, they don't require um, extra cold storage. Um, uh, and um, it makes distribution a little bit uh, easier. And uh, uh, the, the new registered uh, one dose, single dose um, uh, Chinese vaccine is a attractive um, competitor to um, uh, Johnson & Johnson um, uh, vaccine. And um, that is why um, some of the uh, countries are uh, preferring to uh, go to um, China uh, to get its uh, vaccines. And at the same time, as Alex uh, pointed out, uh, US and Europe are not, uh, um, you know, uh, remain uh, kind of, um, not so active in efforts to uh, vaccinate the majority of world population and China um, and Xi Jinping uh, himself told in, uh, told in May 2020 that uh, these uh, Chinese vaccines are for, uh, for, for, for the humanity and this is a global public good, uh, which is um, not exactly a public good, but uh, um, in, in, in minds of uh, Chinese uh, government officials, it is. Um, and uh, we've seen that uh, in uh, s several months, uh, China has been uh, one of the uh, leading countries to uh, export its vaccines. Um, recently, um, Wall Street Journal uh, had a piece on Ethiopia case where uh, the governmental official told that Chinese vaccines are arriving a, at a rate um, of uh, a million a week. Um, and um, 
on the, on the one hand, it shows that uh, China um, is, um, um, you know, very successful in its uh, uh, vaccine diplomacy. But on the other hand, there are um, many questions on uh, whether um, it is, uh, uh, you know, the re real intention of China to help uh, develop countries or um, uh, another uh, instrument to uh, use um, in its favor to uh, rise its uh, reputation across the world and uh, to, uh, you know, use it as a um, another tool to uh, making uh, China great again, uh, to make China a uh, great power as um, other great, uh, great powers in uh, in the world. Uh, but um, also there are uh, questions um, about uh, China's, uh, about the quality of the uh, Chinese vaccines. Um, um, there are different reports on um, different Chinese vaccines uh, that have um, a huge range of uh, the um, eff efficacy of uh, Chinese vaccines. Uh, and this range uh, starts uh, sometimes at 50%. Um, and it's not comparable to um, those of um, um, other countries. Um, if, if we move to um, Central Asia, uh, we would see that um, China has started its talks about um, uh, trials in Central Asia and then exporting to Central Asia of the vaccines in summer 2020. Um, uh, and it had uh, th so three producers, uh, according to the uh, information in the news, th three producers have been uh, talking with uh, the governments of Central Asia. It's Sinovac, Sinopharm, and Anhui uh, to fake uh, companies. Um, and uh, uh, only uh, the third company have uh, successfully negotiated the trials um, in Uzbekistan. And um, interestingly, Uzbekistan was the only um, and, and, and the most um, open to Chinese um, uh, COVID diplomacy uh, among other Central Asian states. On the one hand, it's um, um, understandable because uh, compared to other uh, Central Asian states, uh, Uzbekistan is less um, uh, dependent on China and the society in Uzbekistan is less skeptical towards uh, Chinese uh, products um, as a whole. Um, and now we see that um, Russia is uh, uh, leading this uh, battle, if you want, um, over the Central Asian vaccine uh, diplomacy and uh, all other uh, Central Asian states um, in, in Uzbekistan as well have uh, uh, negotiated and um, talks with Russia to get uh, Sputnik V. Um, and um, except for Uzbekistan, no other uh, Central Asian state had uh, uh, got the uh, Chinese uh, versions. And uh, here, uh, the reason for that is uh, uh, very understandable. It's different for different countries. Uh, all in all, um, I think it's true to say that um, all Central Asian societies are um, skeptical towards um, uh, the quality of Chinese uh, produced um, uh, goods. And uh, in addition to that, uh, Chinese uh, policy in uh, Xinjiang region and uh, the uh, Chinese reputation in Central Asia overall um, has a big impact on that. And um, uh, there, there was a survey in uh, Central Asia Barometer uh, saying that, uh, uh, proving that, 
um, a lot of uh, the majority of the populations of Central Asian states were thinking that Russia is the best uh, solution for the um, to to to, to uh, go through COVID nineteen crisis. Whether uh, uh, less than uh, Ten percent of those who were uh, participating in the survey thought that uh, China is the best. Um, and uh, I would be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tima, for that overview of, of China's efforts and interesting comparisons with with Russia and uh, the other countries. So hopefully, Parviz is, has is, is has returned and he can he can speak. Um, to regionalism and some of the maybe local vaccine efforts that have been um, talked about briefly, uh, particularly in Kazakhstan. So, Parviz, if you're if you're with us, then uh, then the floor is yours. I think you're muted, Parviz. Parviz, you're muted. You're muted. Harvey's, you're muted. Okay, well. Okay, now. Okay. So my, my, uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I have to apologize for these connection problems. We have some repair works in the area. Therefore, it's not so stable. Uh, my task today is to discuss the issue of uh, uh, vaccination, uh, the geopolitical aspects of vaccination problems in Central Asia through the angle of uh, the Central Asians themselves, the, uh, how they consider, how they regard this situation. And uh, 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 I, I would say that uh, Central Asia countries today face uh, a rather complicated challenge. Uh, they have to select one of the available choices for the upcoming uh, vaccination uh, of uh, population. Of course, uh, I mean, uh, the major debates were in the beginning of uh, autumn last year, by the fall of uh, 2020. Now, uh, already at least uh, a larger part of decisions have been made. However, th there are some uh, still uh, some questions and uh, issues to be, to be raised and discussed. Uh, there are three uh, closely interrelated factors that affect uh, the final decisions of uh, the Central Asian governments. Uh, first of all, there is, uh, uh, as it was uh, mentioned many times today, the external or geopolitical group of uh, cluster of factors. Uh, this is mainly the choice between Russia, China, and Europe, uh, who are actually, which are actually the major geopolitical actors and players in the region. So it's not uh, really uh, more the choice a selection of uh, the types of uh, different vaccines, but actually the selection of the major political partners for the future, to some extent. Uh, the, there are three choices also, three, uh, several vaccines. Uh, uh, the, uh, there is a Sputnik one, uh, the two Russians, as it was mentioned today. Uh, the major one is Sputnik uh, B. There is uh, three Chinese, uh, then the, there is a, G a German one and uh, a British AstraZeneca. Geopolitical aspects are perceived by the both sides. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, as it was also mentioned today, the, uh, for the external players, uh, this is the matter of prestige. This is an instrument of future influence to ensure future influence and strengthen society, uh, strengthen their position in the country. This is opportunity for the future as well, I mean, to enter into the local uh, medical uh, and pharmaceutical sectors. And also this is uh, the issue of security, which was also discussed uh, in the, uh, in, uh, both in Russian, uh, first of all, in the Russian mass media 
the issue of security uh, by saying that uh, you cannot stop uh, Corona on the borders and therefore we have to ensure that uh, in the countries which uh, uh, are in good relation with us, we have cooperation, close cooperation with those countries, we have flow of people coming from those countries, we have to ensure that there would be no Corona. First of all, meaning the uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, country, so-called Bližnya Zarubezhya. There is also the issue of uh, the matter of future benefits for locals. Uh, they can, uh, this is a good opportunity for them to ensure better terms for future cooperation, uh, to get some new economic proposals and opportunities for the, for instance, for Tajikistan, if Tajikistan decided to join uh, the Eurasian Economic Union and also for Uzbekistan, which is going to join probably and also some opportunities for local industries because they expect some uh, investments from Russia, for instance, in local factories, but it's actually happening in Kazakhstan. So this is actually the field of trade-offs, of ongoing trade-offs between the countries. The, the second cluster is uh, the economic reasons, so the economic factors. Uh, this is uh, also, we discussed it today, this is the cost of, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, vaccine delivery, the cost of vaccine, uh, the cost of vaccination, the conditions for uh, maintaining the delivered vaccine. Uh, the, the cost of delivery is still not uh, clear. I mean, there are different uh, figures about the cost of Sputnik, uh, the cost of European uh, uh, vaccine also, I mean, it differs. And some of them would be delivered uh, free of charge. And there are also some information that they would be delivered on uh, some lower cost, but there would be some cost anyway. Another issue, which is also uh, somewhere between the geopolitical interest, the geopolitical issue uh, aspects and economic issue and aspect, this is, uh, sorry, so uh, I referred to vaccination passport issue, which was also discussed this uh, in uh, local uh, media and uh, social network. This is uh, the idea that, uh, I mean, if, uh, for instance, the European country decided to accept, to adopt uh, the decree on vaccination passport, so the vaccination passport would be introduced in the European Union. In this case, uh, some vaccines, for instance, Chinese vaccine that would not be approved in the European Union would not be allowed to, uh, uh, so people who uh, use this vaccine they, don't, they will not be they will not uh, get a vaccination passport therefore they will not be allowed to travel to Europe there is also a possibility uh, some alleged possibility that even in Russia if there would be such restrictions, uh, if uh, some of Chinese uh, vaccine would not be uh, approved in Russia, would not be certified in Russia. So it means that Central Asian people who uh, uh, use those vaccines would not be also uh, allowed to, uh, to travel to Russia. There are also uh, these thick cluster of um, factors. This is uh, the local population and public opinion perceptions, how people regard uh, the uh, different options. Uh, this is uh, first about the level of trust uh, to a particular vaccine, a particular country. As it was mentioned, uh, according to opinion polls, there is much little, less uh, trust uh, to uh, Chinese um, providers. Uh, Chinese uh, medical products, uh, and therefore uh, the governments have to take it into account. There is also a, level, uh, a lower level of trust to, to the whole idea of vaccination in general, uh, which could be traced to the previous times. Uh, uh, it's not only about the vaccination against Corona, but it's uh, actually the long uh, story for, for Central Asia.
there is always uh, some mistrust uh, towards uh, vaccination, not only among, uh, among even religious groups of people, but in general in the society. There is also uh, the uh, some contradictory impact on the local propaganda, especially in the countries like Tajikistan, because Tajikistan for many uh, months tries uh, to convince uh, the people that uh, the COVID issue is solved in the country. There is no problem anymore in, the, uh, uh, in uh, Tajikistan. And therefore, there is a kind of uh, contradictory situation because people could say that, yes, of course, if uh, there is no COVID in the country, why we need to have a vaccination? So to some degree, the government itself becomes the victim of its own propaganda because now uh, the government has to convince people that the vaccination is needed. So in general, it was, uh, as, as it was mentioned, uh, the, uh, uh, the Russians proved to be much more successful in uh, pushing forward their uh, options in Central Asia. And I just give you a brief overview of that, uh, the current situation with the uh, vaccination. In Kazakhstan, as it was mentioned, uh, the Sputnik uh, uh, V uh, vaccine, uh, the vaccination started from the 1st of February. There is also its own production envisaged. The local cas uh, uh, also would be probably uh, delivered by the end of April. The government uh, of Kazakhstan announced recently, I mean, it, actually it was in the end of uh, January that uh, it is not going to uh, purchase uh, the Chinese vaccine. Um, although there are still some discussions about this possibility. The Kyrgyzstan, uh, they, have, uh, they would have AstraZeneca, I mean, uh, already uh, 500,000 uh, doses of vaccine uh, delivered in, uh, in February. Uh, the half million of uh, Sputnik is already, is going to be delivered. There are some negotiations with China. In Uzbekistan, uh, the Sputnik is approved. There is uh, some joint authorship uh, with China. There is uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, which already registered uh, in Uzbekistan. There are some uh, vaccine probably delivered in the future by co through the COVAX um, opportunities. In Turp Turkmenistan, there would, there would be Sputnik uh, and uh, Epivac Corona. It's already also registered. This is a Russian vaccine. In Tajikistan, the uh, there the would be uh, COVAX. Uh, the Tajikistani government applied for 2 million doses, uh, which would cover 20% of the population. Uh, there would be on no commercial prices. So we don't think that there would be free of charge. And the rest would be covered by Sputnik. And there is also ongoing negotiations concerning Sputnik. So as I mentioned, I mean, for Tajikistan is also the problem of its own propaganda. I mean, they now told everyone there is no COVID. So if there is no COVID, many even government people within the government believe that, so we don't have COVID, so why we have to have uh, a vaccination? Uh, so this is uh, what I would, wanted to say. So I would be glad to answer the questions. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Molojanov. Um, so we have still have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so the first, we've had um, a couple of questions in the chat. Some of them are interrelated. Some of them um, we've already alluded to, but maybe we, some of the, uh, the panelists can uh, expand on them a little. The first is from Miras, and he's asking about specifically about the Kazakh vaccine that a number of you have um, spoken about. So if, if one of you wants to talk a little bit about Kazakhstan's or the prospect of Kazakhstan, you know, um, becoming a player in vaccine diplomacy within Central Asia, um, exporting the vaccine to other countries. You know, what, what are the prospects of that? What would be the motivations for doing that? So that's the first sort of question. And then we have two questions um, that are sort of interrelated from Mizor, Mizor Hid and from Mirim. Um, and they're both sort of speaking to some of the themes that Parviz has just mentioned in terms of, you know, the fact that 
you know, the case numbers are going down in Central Asia. Um, the region itself seemingly didn't see the same level of a second wave that we saw um, in other parts of the world. Um, and obviously the, um, the need for vaccinations doesn't chime with um, some of the discourse, particularly coming from Turkmenistan and, and Tajikistan, denying the, the existence of the virus in the country anymore. So they're sort of both asking questions around um, the extent to which um, uh, elites themselves are benefiting, you know, what, what role does corruption play in this, um, you know, with, with elites specifically benefiting either financially or, or symbolically from, um, from vaccine rollout. Um, so I don't know who wants to take those questions. I unfortunately have to leave and go to another event. Um, so I'm going to turn over the moderation from here in to Emek Baisalov, who is the uh, uh, the editor at uh, Kabar uh, uh, at IWPR Kabar uh, Central Asia. So um, in terms of the first set of questions, I don't know if uh, Professor Cooley, maybe you want to start. Uh, I'll, I'll just make a brief comment that I think for any country to engage in vaccine diplomacy, and Kazakhstan is one of them, has to be part of a broader agenda. So really the question is, what would Kazakhstan like to accomplish regionally vis-a-vis um, -vis the other countries or its partners, that it would use vaccines in this bundle of engagement? Um, and so I, I would think of it in those terms, analytically anyway. Um, but I think there are a lot more knowledgeable people here about the state of the Kazakh vaccines themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Irmek. So um, today I'm helping the Edward with the moderating questions and answer session. So um, uh, let me continue with the, with the question from Miras. Um, and uh, as Professor Ku said, there may be someone from the region, let's say the Timur, or uh, uh, Dr. Mulajanov can answer the question. Um, is there any opportunity for any type of non-Russian participating schemes to deliver the vaccine across the Central Asia, competing with uh, all of the great powers uh, in vaccine diplomacy in the region? You mean uh, non-Russians, uh, meaning that European or American or what? Probably he is uh, asking about the Western or let's say the Asian vaccine. I was asking about uh, it. It was also mentioned, discussed today that uh, American uh, vaccine is not really convenient uh, in terms of uh, maintenance. Uh, the uh, uh, also the uh, the European ones are much more uh, expensive. Uh, so the only way uh, to get them actually through the uh, some loans and some uh, uh, opportunities given uh, provided by uh, international uh, organizations like ADB or uh, uh, COVAX, etc. Uh, otherwise, I don't think that the local countries would be able to buy it. It would be too expensive. So uh, as, I, as it was shown in the, in the list of, uh, I have demonstrated today that uh, the majority of uh, vaccines delivered, uh, or which would be delivered, uh, which plan, plan to be delivered to Central Asia, they would come through, the, uh, uh, through uh, COVAX. Thank you. Uh, dear Timur, do you have something to add? Um, yes, I would add that, um, unfortunately, uh, Russia becomes, uh, for Central Asia, the only mm, good option uh, in terms of vaccine because, um, as uh, Parviz and Alex already said, that um, Western vaccines are expensive, not because of uh, the price, but because of the transportation. Uh, and going to China brings a lot of risks with it uh, because on the one hand, you have the society that is uh, with high anti-China sentiment. Uh, on the other hand, you have the society that does not trust uh, Chinese uh, products in terms of quality. And you have the countries that are already so much dependent on China, like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan and Turkmenistan in terms of debts. <laughs> Uh, and uh, asking uh, China to send vaccines uh, and raising this debt is a very risky thing to do. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope we uh, try to answer this question. So we have another question. It's really big. It's from Mirza Hit, and uh, um, he asks, uh, um, actually, there's a uh, very long, um, let's say, the um, and, and big text before the question. So let me try to cover it very shortly. You can see it also here in the chat. So he uh, asks about the uh, uh, vaccine diplomacy in uh, multi-vector, let's say multi-vector diplomacy. So uh, how can uh, this play uh, play out in the long run for the for the states, for the small states such as uh, Central Asian states? And here is he saying that uh, uh, there, this is a uh, as um, uh, Minister Kamilov, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, uh, Uzbek Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, recently uh, mused in a meeting with his colleague Lavrov, either all uh, the population were infected and have recovered or something else. The number of new infection cases is just one per million. Do you agree with this description of small state multi-vector diplomacy is an accurate one? And if so, how uh, this can play out in the long run. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, who would like to uh, answer this question? Maybe Dr. Tweek or Dr. Cooley, or it's uh, up to you. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, just briefly, first with the idea that all the population has been infected. You know, is somehow there's not the urgency for vaccination in some of these countries, I, I caution against that with all of the new variants that are emerging of COVID and the possibility of new waves of the, the pandemic in places that are currently in uh, a relative lull in new infections. I, I think there, there is universal urgency to get vaccines into arms as soon as, as we possibly can. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the perception that the that Russia is the only option, that Sputnik V is the only option for many Central Asian countries because of the uh, cold chain requirements, the, the ultra cold temperature requirements and the cost for Pfizer and Moderna um, might not be the way this plays out in the long term. The AstraZeneca vaccine is considerably cheaper than Pfizer and Moderna. Um, AstraZeneca is a big part of the COVID or the COVAX portfolio of vaccines and will become much more widely available uh, moving forward as, as the United States and Western Europe and Canada uh, vaccinate their own populations and, and start to release some of the pre-purchased uh, doses of that vaccine. Um, and then we're also going to start to see some other vaccines come out from the West. I'm thinking here specifically of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, which is a one dose vaccine, relatively inexpensive, uh, does not have the ultra freeze requirements that Pfizer and Moderna do. And importantly, there was just uh, concluded an important agreement between Merck, uh, which doesn't have a vaccine of its own, um, and Johnson & Johnson for Merck to enlist its production capacity in, in making the J&J &J vaccine. And that's going to increase uh, the production numbers quite dramatically and quite quickly. So I, I think that uh, the big picture here is that the slate of available vaccines hasn't been completely filled out yet. And we're going to see uh, considerably more available to uh, countries that have affordability and cold chain needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tweek. Anyone else who would like to also cover this question? Uh, if no, I would like to remind that you can write uh, questions to our speakers here in Zoom's chat or live on Facebook. Please uh, kindly indicate to which speaker you would like to ask a question. We will try to cover all the questions. So uh, here is the, another question from Miriam. She asks that although the vaccinating did not start in Kyrgyzstan, the numbers of people infected are going down. So do you think that the government of Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan's uh, Kyrgyzstan elite, or maybe all Central Asian states elite are using the vaccination for their own benefit? So uh, it's uh, uh, 
little bit of, um, let's say, the conspiracy theory or the good question. Uh, who, who would like to answer this, uh, this uh, question since Miriam did not mention the, uh, the address? I would say that uh, the, the number of uh, people infected are going down. It's not only because of the policy, it's not actually because of the policy of uh, the policy of the state, of the government. But this is uh, just uh, the outcome of uh, uh, age composition of uh, Central Asian countries, like in Tajikistan, 75% of the population are until uh, 40 year old. So, I mean, for them, uh, the uh, corona is not so dangerous. So many people already uh, uh, have been infected and recovered. Uh, some of them without noticing, some of them uh, without uh, heavy cases, having heavy case. Uh, it means that uh, the number of uh, elderly people who really got infected and even uh, died and there were a lot of losses, it wasn't so uh, tangible, so visible as in European countries where the people, uh, I mean, it's two thirds of the population are above their 40s. So it's totally different situation today. So. Uh, the reason why infection is going down in, uh, in Tajikistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan is just because uh, the majority of people or the uh, young people, they've been infected and recovered. But it doesn't mean that uh, a Tajik government says that there is no COVID anymore. There is still COVID in the, COVID in the society. It uh, went down. But uh, we uh, expect uh, the third world, the, the third wave in the whole Central Asia, probably in, uh, in, in spring. Because nothing has actually is done uh, to stop, uh, to prevent this uh, a new re-emergence of uh, the COVID uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the region. And therefore, uh, I mean, the vaccination could stop, but you see, I mean, people and the minister, ministers in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and other countries, they say that there is no rush we are not in rush, we can stop, we can think, we can select. And uh, the time is going on, the time is passing, so they losing the momentum. So the outcome could be very serious. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Molajanov. So uh, here's the, another question from Miriam, and she's asking, are there any cooperation between, uh, for example, China, US or European Union on vaccination, like testing, for example, the different countries, uh, countries vaccine on reporting on the quality or the countries of Central Asia and other developing uh, world need to uh, go with the most economically viable, viable and uh, maybe uh, bad in quality. So who would like to uh, answer this question? Um, maybe Dr. Cooley or Dr. Tweek or maybe Timur. I would defer to Dr. Twig on this. She's the global global health expert here. Thank you. So briefly, we've already seen quite a bit of, uh, of international cooperation with uh, testing of vaccines developed in one country in a range of other countries. So, um, you know, we, we've already noted that there's been testing of uh, some of the Chinese vaccines in some parts of Central Asia. Uh, the Sputnik V vaccine has undergone clinical trials in a handful of other countries. Um, in part, this is an imperative of the pandemic itself. When you have uh, uh, countries that already have had cl many clinical trials on their own soil, they sort of run out of available test populations. And so they need to go to other countries to, to conduct clinical trials of new vaccines that come under development and, and need to be tested. Um, I, I'd like to zero in on this question about having to somehow settle for poorer quality vaccines in some parts of the world or among poorer countries, because we hear this even, even in the United States where we started giving the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines first. Um, 
the reported efficacy of those vaccines is in the 94, 95% range. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the other vaccines that are starting to come online, especially the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccines are reported to have overall efficacy in preventing any infection um, in the you know, 60, 70% range. And, and we're starting to see the evolution of a perceived sort of vaccine quality hierarchy and, and a fear that the rich people, the rich white people in the United States are gonna get uh, Pfizer and Moderna and the more disadvantaged racial minority communities in the United States will then be left with a poorer quality um, Johnson & Johnson or, or later on when it's eventually approved AstraZeneca vaccine. And, and that, that fear, I think, plays out globally as well. And I just like to caution against that. You know, the, these numbers for vaccine efficacy, the difference between 94 to 95% versus 60 to 70%, the clinical trials that produced those results were carried out among different populations under very different circumstances. I wouldn't put a whole lot of... Uh, of emphasis on the specifics of those numbers, especially when you look at the chart of how well these vaccines prevent severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And they're all coming in at about 100% effective across the board. And so all of these vaccines do what they need, what we need them to do. They prevent, you know, they present, prevent serious illness, hospitalization, and death. And so I, I think we're playing a, a counterproductive game uh, when we, uh, when we you know, play into perceptions that somehow there are some vaccines that, that are better than others, that they're all good at doing what we need them to do. Thank you, Dr. Tweet. So we have uh, two more question, questions, and uh, one is from Aijan Shasheno, and she's asking, is there information on which sets of vaccines have been approved in Central Asian countries? Without formal approvals, they cannot be available to the general population, uh, even if the governments receive them from the China, Russia, EU, UK, COVAX program. Uh, maybe uh, someone has a uh, uh, update or the information about it. Maybe uh, Dr. Mulajanov, uh, well, I think uh, yeah, as, touched as I a said, little bit. As I said, uh, that uh, Sputnik is approved in all countries. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, cas COVID local uh, in Kazakhstan it would, would, will be uh, approved uh, when it is uh, delivered, so far no, no, no clear, not clear. In Kazakhstan, uh, I mean, uh, still discuss. I'm not sure about the Chinese options for Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, AstraZeneca actually approved in uh, Kyrgyzstan already, uh, officially Sputnik as well. Uh, mm -hmm. the, with regard to China, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, there is probably negotiations are going on. The Uzbekistan uh, Sputnik also is approved. Uh, the local uh, uh, ZFUS uh, VAC 2001 uh, vaccine, uh, which actually Uzbekistan has joined authorship, uh, is already registered. Uh, they're going to construct uh, to build the factory. Uh, the co I mean, whatever would be produced through co uh, uh, would have uh, organization th that would be also approved by local governments. And Tajikistan mm -hmm. the same. I mean, uh, I mean, whatever they have, they would be approved. So the only case of uh, approval is uh, the uh, uh, the Chinese uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. They are question because of the quality, because of opinion poll, because also, as it was mentioned, there are some geopolitical considerations important for local countries. Like uh, for Tajikistan, it's very important not to spoil the relationship with the, uh, with the Moscow, not to irritate Moscow too, too much because uh, uh, the countries which provide migrants for uh, Russian labor market, they're extremely interested today to open the borders and to send their migrants back to Russia. For them, it's much more important than for the Russians themselves. It's a great key, key question for them. So they they do whatever required, they will, will do whatever required by Moscow, uh, but to get this uh, final approval. And Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malajano. So um, uh, I think we have the last question from Kasiet, and she asked, uh, she asks, how, what do you think? Uh, 
who has won the Inner Central Asia COVID-19 related diplomacy, if any. Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan have tried to provide the healthcare related aid. So I, I would like to also um, add a, little, uh, a, a small comment to this question. Today we have uh, discussed uh, mainly the foreign vaccines, but uh, we have uh, talked a little bit about uh, the inner Central Asian vaccines. If I'm not mistaken, the Kazakhstan at the early stages they have tried to do their own vaccine, Uzbekistan as well. So maybe it can be a little bit related to this question. Who do you think in the Central Asia has won this uh, COVID-19 related diplomacy inside of the region, let's say the leaders of our region, uh, informal leaders, Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan? Maybe uh, Timur would like to uh, uh, answer this question or, or any other speaker. I would say that the race is not over yet, um, and we um, are uh, maybe even in, in the beginning of this race because uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, vaccines particularly, but uh, as far as I uh, read in the news, uh, those vaccines are under trial and are not uh, for uh, general uh, rollout yet, uh, even in the countries that are uh, producing this uh, vaccine. So uh, for now, in the short term, uh, we can't say that um, Russian vaccine is more popular than any other vaccine in the region. And uh, it will be uh, logical to say that um, Russia is uh, winning if, if you want. But uh, in the long term, there are a lot of different options. And as uh, Dr. Tweek said, um, uh, not only from uh, the region itself, but also from uh, Western countries. So I guess uh, this is just uh, the beginning. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So. Um, Dear speakers, thank you uh, very much for your contribution to uh, today's discussion and for trying to uh, answer all the questions. I think it, it was really interesting uh, for everyone and uh, it brought here together many people from different countries. Uh, so I would like to thank our partners from the OXA Society for their help in organizing this joint event. Uh, our dear speakers and uh, uh, I hope this event will be followed by many different joint projects. Uh, for those who missed the start, the video will be available on YouTube soon and the detailed uh, highlight will be also um, released on the Cabarasia.web website. So um, let me give a floor to the uh, uh, Regional Dir Director of IWPR in Central Asia, Abahon Sultanazar, for the closing remarks. Dear Abahon. Uh, thank you very much, Remek, uh, dear all. Really, what an incredible event it was. Uh, I had the pleasure, uh, you know, great pleasure listening to all of you. I would like to extend my gratitude to, to everyone who joined the event today. I would like to thank our panel of experts and the chairs of today's event. Uh, Dr. Alexander Kuli, uh, Dr. Judith Tweek, Dr. Paliz Monajanov, Timur Omarov, and uh, Edward Lemon and uh, Remek Baisal for facilitating the discussion and raising many important questions. You really gave us uh, a great tour of the issues and challenges uh, around the vaccination and politics around the team, especially in Central Asia. I'm sure uh, that you underlined for us the great importance of uh, being aware and thinking freshly about these problems and possible ways out of them. Uh, our today's discussion uh, I would say it would not be possible without the great help and support from our valid partner, uh, the OXI Society for Central Asian Affairs. We very much appreciate uh, our partnership and look forward to having more joint events uh, with uh, OXI Society. I sincerely hope uh, that you join today's discussion. And uh, just for information, please follow our news and join the upcoming events and Kabar Asia, the Central Asia Bureau for Political Reporting at uh, 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 www.cabar.asia. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, dear Abahon. So, dear friends, 
let me close on this positive note our discussion and thank everyone for their attention. See you soon and have a good day, good night, uh, wherever you are. Good day. Goodbye. Thank you very much, all.